Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you to the conference organizers for inviting me to speak today. It's a great privilege and an honor. I'm going to talk about the topic of biotechnology, and in particular, judging biotechnology. This work stems from uh, some of the work I did um, in part from my office at the University of Saskatchewan and in part from my home office in Richard's house last year uh, when I was on sabbatical at the U of S, um, which was a homecoming for me after spending um, uh, the better part of the last decade at the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law I spent last year at the U of S working on these kinds of questions. And uh, what I hope to do to you today is to sort of uh, open up a general discussion and broaden our idea about what the regulatory system uh, actually looks like so that we can engage in uh, discussion about ways in which we can improve that system. Uh, this comes from work that's funded by SHRC, the Social Sciences uh, uh, and Humanities Research Council, and Genome Canada through a project based um, uh, at Genome Prairie at the U of S called Valgen. So um, it's really a presentation about how we adapt to the challenges of regulating biotechnological innovation. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that one of the ways, one of the most important ways we adapt to uncertainty in the terms of the regulatory environment is by putting the responsibility on judges to interpret and apply regulations. And this is a point that's often overlooked. Very often we think about the regulatory system as a public bureaucratic exercise, something that is done um, by government officials in Ottawa. And it's, a, it's an administrative exercise. But I'm going to demonstrate how that's only uh, one view of regulation. We've also got to look at regulation as an inherently political exercise. And because it's politicized... Oftentimes we see regulations or the regulatory system leaving loopholes or ambiguities. And those ambiguities inevitably get resolved by judges when disputes arise in practice. And we need to see this as a holistic system. This is the textual version of my presentation. You will be very pleased to know that I'm not going to read this to you. But if you're interested in a text-based presentation, you can go online after the conference and read a summary of what it is that I talked about. I'm a firm believer in the adage that a picture is worth a thousand words, so I can present to you a 50,000 word dissertation in the next 30 minutes. Um, but actually what I'd like you to do is to start by closing your eyes and painting a picture yourself. So everybody close their eyes, and I want you to think about an image of regulation. What does regulation look like to you? Okay, open your eyes. I'm a lawyer, and so to a lawyer, this is what regulation looks like. A stack of books on a shelf. Of course, nowadays, these are um, digital. But this is, in essence, what regulation looks like to many lawyers, what many lawyers think of when you talk about regulation. I don't suspect this is an audience full of lawyers. There are economists in the room. This is what regulation looks like to an economist. Now, I don't mean just those economists working on the topic of game theory or um, using other analytical frameworks, but I think thinking about this in terms of monopoly money is helpful because it allows us to think about regulation as a transaction cost. A transaction cost in two ways. So in one way, it's a transaction cost. It can be when you land in jail. You roll the dice three times. You try your hand at the regulatory system. You don't succeed, so you pay. And that's how you get out of the regulatory jail. Okay? But there's another kind of regulation that constitutes um, an important thing to think about here, and that's regulation in the form of rents in the private sector. And what I'm thinking of in particular here is intellectual property rights. It's an important way in which we allow private sector actors a role in the regulatory system. If the regulatory system is about giving a green light whether you can go ahead with an innovation or not go ahead. One of the most important things in that analysis is the patent landscape. So you can think about regulation as a sort of a form of, um, or intellectual property rights rather, as a form of uh, a, a part of the regulatory system, the private aspect of the regulatory system. So if you're not a lawyer or an economist, but an entrepreneur, that's the regulatory system. To an entrepreneur, interested in working in this field, interested in innovating and in creating a new business or a new product, 
The regulatory system is essentially a series of hurdles that you've got to jump over. Now, for many people in society, when you think of a regulatory system, civil society in particular, you see images like this. And this is what the system is supposed to be regulating. The regulatory system saves us from these kinds of images. So we've talked a little bit about uh, lawyers and economists and entrepreneurs and civil society. To a policymaker, oftentimes we think about regulation like this. People talk about regulation as a drag on innovation, an anchor weighing down the innovative process. But the anchor can also serve another purpose. It can keep us in position. It can give us our bearings, keep our bearings, help us to establish our orientation, keep us in one place. This particular anchor is in the middle of a dry field. And so what I want you to ask yourself is whether our current regulatory system for agricultural biotechnology is playing the same role as this anchor or whether it's an anchor in open waters. When you take an academic perspective, when you step back and try to understand what's happening with the regulatory system as a whole, oftentimes the analogy of a web helps. Regulation is a network, it's a system that's interconnected. I like this metaphor that regulation is a web. Businesses get stuck in it. The public policymakers weave it. But I think it's too beautiful. The real regulatory system doesn't have that kind of graceful symmetry. It doesn't look like that. If you're talking about some real-world regulatory systems, say for certification, labeling, and marketing of organic crops, that's a better indication of what the regulatory system really looks like. If you are interested in plants with novel traits, that's the regulatory system governing the introduction of a new plant with a novel trait in Canada. If you want to take corn and turn it into ethanol and you're interested in the entire regulatory system governing biofuels, that's it. So oftentimes when we think about a regulatory system, we have this sort of vast realm of public regulations. They can be federal or provincial. We've got private rights. And trying to find your way through the regulatory system is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. What we need to be able to do this effectively is basically a map. So a lot of people have begun doing work on mapping regulatory systems. How many of you have been to London and taken the tube? Most of us. So you realize the problem with this map of the system of transportation under, in underground London is, first of all, if you tried to use this map to get from one point on the surface to another point on the surface, it would be completely useless because it's actually not a real depiction of what the city of London looks like. And second of all, if you tried to take this from one place to another, underground London, you'd run into problems because inevitably there's going to be one line that's not operating. And anybody who's any, ever spent any time in London will appreciate the, the truth of that. But it starts to help us think about mapping a regulatory system. And I think that's the way in which we need to start conceiving of regulation. Not as a... Um, no, not using any of the imagery that I started with, but as, as a system like this, a system um, like this. Now, un unfortunately, the regulatory system is not quite as simplistic as a sixth grade uh, solar system uh, diorama. I think one of the best ways of thinking about the regulatory system is like this. To me, when I think of what the regulatory system is, and how to start to diagnose some of the challenges in the regulatory system and, um, and the opportunities for improvement, you've got to think of it as a nervous system. And all of these uh, elements in the regulatory system are fundamentally interconnected, and, they, and they've all got to be firing together in order to make the system as a whole functional. Now, let me put this in more concrete terms for you by talking about the system 
that we use to govern agricultural biotechnology in Canada. As I mentioned at the beginning, we oftentimes start with this view of the regulatory system as, a, uh, as something that's created by the public servants working in all of these departments, whether it's agriculture and agri-food or environment or um, fisheries or trade uh, or industry Canada. It would be much simpler, in fact, if there were only federal departments to worry about, but we know that's not the case. We've got provincial ministries involved in everything from agriculture to energy to enterprise that are all involved playing a role in the regulatory process. And I suspect many of us here today come from this background. But what we need to appreciate is that underlying this exercise of creating and implementing and administering the regulatory system, fundamentally, there are political decisions that are being made. And political decisions are driving the regulatory process in practice. When we realize that the regulatory system is inherently a political exercise, we can understand that because these seats are filled with members of an opposition party, and there are so many different voices and interests being weighed and balanced and juggled in the political process leading to a regulatory system, that inevitably compromises are made. Some issues are left open-ended and unresolved. Some issues are resolved generally through the creation of a basic framework. And when we have these regulatory frameworks in place, they may be created not only by the federal government, by provincial governments as well. This is half of the provincial governments here involved in making regulations that, that directly impact agricultural biotechnology policy. So we have these regulations that are inherently political, and because they're political, they involve ambiguities, open-endedness, that need to be interpreted, applied, and put into practice. Well, one of the key bodies that does that are courts. Oftentimes, to people outside of the legal community, the courts, decisions of the courts, like the Supreme Court of Canada, are shrouded in this fog. You don't really understand what's going on. Why did, why did the Supreme Court of Canada decide what it did about the patentability of higher life forms in the Harvard mouse case? And how does that make sense? How does the decision make sense when you read Monsanto versus Schmeiser in the Supreme Court of Canada? What is the Supreme Court doing with the regulatory system here that governs agricultural biotechnology policy. The key point here is to make the recognition initially that the courts do have a role to play. And I want to tell you about that role by talking a little bit about uh, some recent developments. If you look back no more than a decade, and we take this example I mentioned earlier of intellectual property as being a sort of a public-private system, a hybrid system of uh, regulating innovation. Most people think um, of the Harvard mouse case. For those of you not familiar, um, Harvard College versus Canada, uh, the commissioner of patents, was about uh, a mouse, a genetically modified mouse. Its genes were molecularly engineered so that every time the mouse was bred in a laboratory, it would get cancer exceptionally useful for scientific research. Everywhere in the world, the mouse is patented. The question is, what about Canada? The case went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and it was an incredibly important decision. It was going to set the future about the patentability of higher life forms, and not just mice, but any higher life forms, including plants. To understand this, you actually have to skip out a little bit and um, uh, go back to a previous decision of the Supreme Court of Canada involving uh, Pioneer Hybrid. Pioneer attempted to patent uh, soybean. And the soybean had been um, cultivated through crossbreeding. The problem for the Supreme Court of Canada was not that these kinds of organisms 
were not patentable, but simply a technicality that in this particular case, um, simply submitting a sample of the plant wasn't enough uh, to meet the requirements for a patent. So it was, it was sort of introduced here in the late 1980s that this was going to be a problem. Eventually, we were going to have to decide whether or not we were going to allow patents on uh, life forms, including plants and, and animals. So what the government did was struck the uh, Biotechnology Advisory Committee, the CBAC, Canadian Biotechnology Advisory Committee, and asked them to do work on a wide range of different areas. Intellectual property was just one of the topics that they worked on. They released a report in 2002 about patenting higher life forms and related issues. And here's what they had to say. Among many other things, they recommended that a farmer's privilege be included in the Patent Act. That's a right to save seeds, even patented seeds, from one year to another. They recommended that the Patent Act be amended to include provisions that protect innocent bystanders. Now you can see how these kind of changes would have a dramatic impact on innovation. But these are the kinds of changes that an expert committee can easily make. But for parliamentarians to actually take the step of putting these laws into practice is a very significant step. It would be incredibly controversial, very difficult to do that, very difficult to justify. Those are changes recommended to the Patent Act. They said, in terms of changes to tort law, this is the liability in case GMOs go wrong. They said, well, this is actually a provincial issue. It's not a federal issue. But provincial law deals with this already. Canadian law already ad adequately addresses issues of liability and compensation. Specific provisions for damages caused by products of biotechnology, patented or not, are not required. Now, this is very typical to see a report like this containing recommendations about what we should do with the regulatory system, intellectual property regulations or any other kind of regulations. You see these kinds of reports. But the thing is, this comes out in 2002. By December of 2002, the Supreme Court had already decided the issue. The Supreme Court said in Harvard College that mice are not patentable. Higher life forms are not patentable. Not in Canada. So this was a path-breaking decision. It was a big deal. And it went against the recommendations of the Biotechnology Advisory Committee. And what the Supreme Court said was that if Parliament doesn't like that, it's perfectly feasible to amend the Patent Act and change the legislation. But of course, that's in a dreamland. The effort it would take to have Parliament really consider this issue and reopen it, this is a years-long debate, incredibly political, all kinds of different opinions on all sides of the debate, very, very difficult to do. So what happened instead is not surprising. You can link to all of these decisions uh, from my presentation if you're interested. It was Monsanto versus Schmeiser, two years later, 2004. For those of you not familiar, uh, Percy Schmeiser, I actually probably shouldn't even say that, of course everybody's familiar with Percy Schmeiser, Bruno Saskatchewan farmer who grew genetically modified canola without a license, claimed it blew onto his land. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and what the Supreme Court said is two things. About Percy Schmeiser's case in particular, they said, we don't believe you, you're liable for patent infringement. But the other part was the broader question about whether plants are patentable. Can you get a patent for genetically modified canola in Canada? And based on the Harvard mouse case, the answer was almost certainly no. But two years later, some changes in the Constitution of the Supreme Court, a few new judges in, a few old judges out, and we get a decision that's the opposite. They say, well, you cannot patent higher life forms, like a mouse or a plant. But Monsanto didn't try to patent a plant here. What Monsanto did was patented a gene and a cell. And that's okay. So here's the deal. You cannot patent higher life forms in Canada, but you can patent life's building blocks, which is functionally the same thing. Okay? So we see here how this decision, which we think about as kind of a regulatory decision or a policy decision, something that parliamentarians should be making, something that the... Um, Department should be providing expert opinion and consultative advice on is really a judicial decision. And the law in Canada today 
is that you can get a patent on genes and cells, and so everything is just fine, all because of what the courts did. Now, when we think about what the impact of these judicial rulings are, I think the cases like this generate far more or public interest than most discussions of regulatory policy do. And that's important for us to realize as well. When we sit in this room and talk about regulatory policy, I'm not sure the public outside of this hotel really understands what we're talking about or really cares. But when Percy Schmeiser goes to the Supreme Court of Canada, this is what happens. No one should control nature. No one should control life. No one should have that right to put patents on nature and life. As long as my wife and I have life within us, we will always go down to fight for the rights of farmers, always to be able to use their seed from year to year. No one should take that right away from anyone. Look at the size of the audience. Now, we can dissect all of the things that Percy Schmeiser went on to say and the inaccuracies in the documentary about Percy Schmeiser's case, but the point I'm trying to make here is how much attention this gets. So this is what the public thinks about when they think about the agricultural biotechnology regulatory system. And I think we, as people who are interested in the regulatory system, really need to appreciate that fact. When I teach the Monsanto versus Schmeiser case in my law school class, we start off by playing folk songs written about Percy Schmeiser. No joke, the ballad of Percy Schmeiser. This is the impact that judicial decisions are having. That's Eric Peterson. You recognize him. All the way back from Canadian hits from street legal to corner gas. He's now playing the role of Percy Schmeiser in the theatrical stage version of Schmeiser versus Monsanto. I would tell you I'm making this up, but I couldn't. <laughs> Percy Schmeiser was not the only person involved in litigation with Monsanto. I showed you an image of the Supreme Court of Canada, but these issues are just as alive in Humboldt Provincial Court, where, per where, where Louise Schmeiser took small claims action against Monsanto for contaminating her organic garden. She sued for $200 and lost. That fact that Louise Schmeiser couldn't get $200 from Monsanto for contaminating her organic garden meant that organic canola growers in the province of Saskatchewan and the Saskatchewan Organic Directorate had a huge uphill battle when they tried to file a class action lawsuit against Monsanto. In case you're not familiar, this is the case of Hoffman versus Monsanto. The plaintiffs claimed that because of the introduction of genetically modified canola in the province of Saskatchewan, European and Japanese consumers would no longer purchase Canadian canola or canola oil or any products based from canola. They couldn't get regulatory approval to import these products into Europe. So they sued. They tried to blame Monsanto for the dramatic economic losses that ensued. The real interesting thing about this case is that the lawyer they hired to sue Monsanto was the same lawyer Percy Schmeiser hired to defend the litigation brought by Monsanto general practitioner in Saskatoon named Terry Zakreski. He did a fine job. He tried. But there was a fundamental imbalance in terms of the legal resources. And the case had some weaknesses. So it didn't work. The Court of Queen's Bench rejected the claim. The Court of Appeal did the same thing. It's interesting, actually, that the Saskatchewan courts, though, have taken a slightly different approach than courts in Ontario. I don't know if you're familiar with a case called Sour versus Canada, but this involved beef farmers in Ontario sued the government over the failure to deal adequately with the mad cow crisis, launched a class action and said it was the government's fault that other countries had banned Canadian beef and that the government was responsible for the economic losses.
They got certified as a class action, and the case is still going on. What's happened more recently in the courts, an Ontario uh, farmer named Charles Rivette, Rivette and a couple of other farmers, were sued by Monsanto on the same grounds as Percy Schmeiser was sued for growing genetically modified crops without a license. The days where you would deny liability and say, well, I think it was insects or birds or it spilled off a truck, those are gone. What farmers do now instead is they say, mea culpa, I did it, I'm sorry. But it actually didn't do me any good. Because, you see, I could have not grown genetically modified canola and made more money. So the fact that the canola was genetically modified, or in this case it was soybeans, really didn't give me any economic benefits. So yes, I'm liable for patent infringement, but I don't owe you anything. Your patent really didn't do any good. And the courts bought that argument. They said, yeah, you're right. The damages worked out to be about the same price, about the same amount as the cost of a license would have been. Think about the implications of this. If what an, an ag biotech company can do with its patent is basically get a, settle, or get, get a judgment from a court that's the same amount as the license would have been in the first place, what incentive does a farmer have, other than sort of moral or ethical incentives, but what financial incentive does a farmer have to not try to grow the crop without a license initially, and if they get sued, the worst thing that happens is they pay an amount that's what the license would have been in the first place. I don't think we've really grappled with the implications of this decision. It's just 2010. But if this is the pattern, we need to seriously think about the portfolios, the patent portfolios of ag biotech companies and what this means for innovation. It's a major problem. I've been talking so far about Canadian decisions, but we need to think globally. I don't know if you're familiar with the decision of the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice recently decided a case called Monsanto versus Cefetra. Cefetra is an Argentinian company that exports soy meal. Now, Argentina is one of the few places in the world where Monsanto does not have a patent for its molecularly engineered genes and genetically modified cells. Argentina, there is no Argentinian patent. But there is a patent in Europe. So when the Argentinian producer sent the soy meal to a harbor in Amsterdam, Monsanto had it seized and said that contains traces of our patented DNA and tried to sue on that basis. The European Court of Justice said, no, that's not going to fly. The patent is only valid if it's, if it's uh, promoting its function, which is, in this particular case, resistance to glyphosate-based herbicide. So in this particular instance, Monsanto lost. But the point here I'm making is that it's not just the Canadian courts that we need to be thinking about as having a dramatic impact on the regulatory system. It's the European courts and the American courts. And we need to start thinking about this globally, not just in Canada. Now, the example I've given you here relates to intellectual property, and I've tried to explain to you why I think intellectual property is a regulatory issue, fundamentally a regulatory issue, but I could have done the same presentation with any regulation, whether it's interpreting the regulatory system for plants with novel traits or the Seeds Act. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is that we need to start thinking about this more holistically, using a systems approach. And when we think about regulation in a systems approach, I think we're able to make some better progress in terms of really identifying what the challenges are and coming up with solutions to those challenges that reflect a very broad understanding of what regulation is. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jeremy.